That's one way of learning. And after that, people will assume the leadership and learn from the mistakes they made. And they can all know the process very well. But the mistakes are around rather subtle, uh, fine points of the process and how many ways you can get off the process and things like that from just learning it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very good way to learn leadership in dream work. And, and this, these, you're not advocating necessarily that a person be in, uh, in a professional, in other words, in the already in the okay. <laughs> I'm prejudiced against okay. highly developed professionals. Okay. Okay. Because like me, they would have to recover from their training. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously. No, the only qualification is that once in your life you had a dream. <laughs> That's all. And, and, and you also have to have... Uh, and once in your life you, you, you had a poem that touched you. So you know what a metaphor is. If you know those two things, you're, you've got your entrance fee. And, and do you do sort of brush-up courses, like to, like, suppose leaders need to come back? Oh, and... oh people have, have come back repeatedly. You see, I, 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 I mentioned that I taught in Sweden for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Sweden's a small country, and, you know, if I do dream group in the south, they hear about it in the north, and so on. And so I, I kept coming back for 22 years, three months a year. Mm -hmm. And people had 20 or 30 experiences. And 12 years ago, uh, they organized, I felt that they were ready to organize their own training society, and they did. The Drum Group Forum, the Dream Group Forum. branch of it has started in Finland. Uh, but now they're, they're training people, and I go back now just to, for, for short sessions, just two weeks instead of six weeks in the spring and six weeks in the fall, when I used to. But now I go back, or I have gone back, I was back a year ago. I was back last April. Yeah, last April, for two weeks, just to witness. And at the end of that, those two sessions, I learned whether they need more than what a dream group can give them, or whether they should, or whether they take getting into a dream group in order to bypass more serious, consistent therapy of some kind. You mean people who attend? See, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, um, uh, uh, re uh, refuse anyone who calls me and wants to come to a group. But I, on occasion, it doesn't happen often, they come into a group for the wrong reason. It needs a little experience in handling group process because sometimes the tension arises in the same group between people or between the group and the leader or whatever. And you have to stop the process and resolve it. Okay. Can you say anything about working with our own dreams? Uh, we have a lot of dreams that we can't bring to a group right. because we're dreaming right. maybe right. every day or mm -hmm. several mm -hmm. times a week right. of taking the process and do any you know any changes and like should it be done soon after a dream the next day well, or how might one yeah, do the process? A, a, a dream loses some of its energy with time unless it's a very powerful dream. It's best to do it soon after and, and, and what you can do is pretty much take from uh, I mean, you should always start with your own immediate associations. You, know, you don't start with telling the dream, and you just listen, and I'm going to give you my projection. <laughs> you start with your own association, and they may, may or may not be enough. But after that, uh, you can... Um, uh, you can play the game with yourself. You can pretend that uh, you'll take some high-flying projections and take a chance on it, if you like. You know, treat it as a game. You know, what could a, a, a Labrador retriever be uh, uh, as a metaphor? What could a grandmother be as a metaphor? You know, you lose up in this culture. You can have pretty many meanings to a metaphorical image. And you can ask yourself the questions we ask in the three stages, in the context and in the playback. Uh, you know, 
just there, take a second and call it, look at the dream and see what happened, what you can bring up to you. So you, you can use what you can use out of this process and, and do it. If you have a partner, it works very well. A partner could be the dream. Mm. Good question. Let's face it, like on her dream, she never mentioned her grandmother in the dream. It was only later when she was explaining. So is it is it um, well, it correct? Was, it, it was explaining that it, it, it was in the dream that it was her grandmother. Did, didn't you, did you say it was something like that? It was like my grandmother's sleeping room. Yeah. But you said that in the dream, or no. did you say no, that it's later? A that was a later. Clarification. Were you aware of that in, in the dream that it was your I grandmother's? Was huh? I was aware of that in the dream. You were? Yeah. She was Absolutely. aware of it in the dream, then it's in the dream. Okay. 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 I thought she wasn't. Right. right. I was asked to ask you whether you'll be giving any more uh, workshops or leadership trainings. Is that what you yeah. wanted to know? Yeah. They're always saying it's the last one. I just wondered if you're going to have a right You're on record. You're on record <laughs> here, Ron. <laughs> I'm, over, I'm, over, I'm approaching my 87th birthday. I've got to, I don't plan too far in the future. <laughs> but I hope to give some. The Swedes are threatening, making noises that they're going to come over as a group. They've done that three or four times in the past. They just, you know, come over here, have a good time, and have a good uh, uh, training session. But if all is well in the spring, I, I hope to have another one for um, anybody else. Is this work always done in a group setting? Is it ever done one on one? Um, well, um, I've had this experience. Uh, I'm not in practice anymore. Um, but on occasion, uh, something w was opened up in, in, in the group that the dreamer couldn't deal with in the group, and would ask if, if she could work with me privately, and I would generally agree. You know. But I don't encourage it. I'm no longer in practice, and uh, it doesn't come up too often. But if, if it were, I would. In other words, it's a process that can work. In this, in, well, if somebody wanted to okay, of course, yeah. make it in right. their I mean, practice. All I'm doing with you in teaching this process mm -hmm. is what I learned to do with patients in a one to one situation. Mm -hmm. So I didn't come out of the air. Mm -hmm. In a group, one person's comment, a lot of times I'll feel I make a comment but, and then a whole bunch of people yeah. feed off of it. That's and right. it, it's a ongoing thing, so there's more energy and more ideas floating around in a group. Oh, absolutely. I think this is the ideal way you know, to do dream work. You see, I think the psychoanalytic arrow, which I had 15 years of and taught on two psychoanalytic faculties, uh, is not the ideal. I mean, the, the doing dream work in therapy, is, I think, is terribly important. But you're at certain handicaps. You're, you're, you're in a 45-minute hour. You don't know when the dream is going to bring the dream up. He has other items on his agenda. And then you, you, how far can you get if you have a, even a short dream? Took us almost two, well two and a half, three hours. Mm -hmm. You know, how, you know, you have to uh, mm -hmm. work it into what you can do in in the analytic framework of, of the uh, therapeutic line and agenda and and so on. This is the ideal way, and it's one of the reasons I got out of the business of psychoanalysis. One of the reasons. Uh, because I, I, I wanted to do dream work. And the event, it took me a long time. I was 57 when I went to Sweden and, and developed this process. Mm -hmm. I had, I had a, uh, uh, a captive audience. <laughs> I was the only teacher. <laughs> and I was teaching dreams, so I taught them this way. Is there anything, okay, say a dreamer works in the workshop and get some insight. Mm -hmm. They come back next week and share it. In, on certain occasions, someone gives a delay orchestration. Is there anything further that a dreamer ought to do or ways they ought to think or approach or apply what they've learned, or is it something that just comes to one? Well, if we do the dream work, then we're doing all that any therapist can really do. 
we're bringing the dreamer a little bit closer to their own reality, their own subjective reality, their own emotional reality. And that puts them in a position not of having solved all their life problems, but in a better, a slightly better position to confront those life problems. You see, what, what happens here is exactly what in analytic school they talk about as if it's a terribly difficult thing to do, overcoming resistance. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the analytic process, but you know, analysis is the analysis of, of transference and resistance. <laughs> But here, if we create a safe environment for a dreamer, and where the dreamer recognizes it as, as safe, and where the dreamer trusts the leader of the process, the, the, resist, the, the resistance melts away. And they don't disappear. As soon as you go outside this door, they'll come back, but they don't come back in the same old way. You see. Because being people come into this world with a natural curiosity about dreaming. And they have a natural curiosity because dreaming is a built-in healing mechanism. And if my body can heal me physically, why can't my body heal me emotionally? And they come into the world with this curiosity. I can't give a lecture. I can tell an audience, you know, from now till doomsday that only the dreamer knows what's in the dream. And afterward, people would come up and say, I had this dream, what does it mean? <laughs> they don't hear it. They just, they, just, they just don't hear it, you see. Because Americans, uh, you know, are, are, uh, are not used to being that honest. Uh, so then, what, what do you think is the role of, like, archetypes in dreams? Don't you feel there are any universal symbols? No. You don't believe any of that? No, I, I, feel, I feel that symbols are culturally derived. We've all had a mother. And so the mother, we both had a grandmother, a grandmother. I call him an earth mother, an archetype, you're welcome to, but I don't. Uh, and I, I don't see any universal symbols, uh, as, as Jung did. Uh, even Freud didn't really believe in Jung, in, but he, he became so enamored of sexual symbols that you know, they, they became universal. For example, I had a, someone this was in an analytic program that I was teaching. And I was using this method. This was up in Westchester. If I came back from Sweden, I taught uh, dreams this way, uh, training things. And one, one woman presented a dream in which there was a flagpole. Now, the psychoanalytic part of me, <laughs> a flagpole, obviously. It's a male organ, female. Can't be anything else. What else could a flagpole be? But what came out was, it was, when she was a little girl, her, her, her father owned a country uh, hotel of some kind, an inn. And it was her job every morning at 6 o'clock to raise the flag. Mm. <laughs> so that's what a flag for <laughs> meant. Mm. <laughs> but, but that just illustrates that I don't, I don't take any, any image for granted. It's what it means to the dreamer now. Mm. This, this, this brings up an interesting issue for me, which is, that if all dreams are personal, then this idea of dreams as being uh, like part of a spiritual practice that means some part, part of a spiritual practice that means something for more than one person, you don't believe in that? I don't. Well, I don't know. I was curious. <laughs> I do. You do. I, oh, yes. I think dreams come out of any one of four dimensions of the way we live our life. Mm -hmm. I think dreams can pick up biological changes in us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes pathological changes that haven't caused any clinical symptoms can appear in a dream. That's the biological dimension. We have a biological unconscious. Dreams, as you know from Freud, can pick up our personal unconscious. Mm -hmm. We live in a society, don't we? Mm -hmm. Well, we live in a society, and I think you can probably say this of all so-called civilized societies, that they're not civilized enough. They're still trying to work out what it means to be civilized. Mm. So there's a lot of negative fallout. And dreams have social reference. Anti-Semitism, uh, racism, all the isms mm. will seep into our dreams even if we don't think of ourselves as prejudiced right. people. Right. 
and it was the social reference of dreams. There's a, there's a social unconscious that deals with the negative fallout and the positive fallout from being social creatures in a given organized society at a given time. And we live in a world, a universe, that is not of our own making. So there's a, a larger dimension, a transcendental, there's no one word for it, transcendental, spiritual, religious, cosmic dimension. Uh, religion tries to address that, but my opinion does not succeed effectively in addressing it. But it exists out there. And there is a transpersonal, transcendental dimension to dreaming. Dreaming, to use a, 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 the, the quantum mechanical term, non-locality, is that meaning to you? Both to you? Non-locality? I'm, I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> no, I well, know. okay, but what it means, and it's important in connection with dreaming, I've had a second career in parapsychology. Um. And, and I got into it because patients on the couch when I was a practicing analyst picked up in their dreams things about my personal life that they had no business knowing about mm -hmm. and couldn't have inferred in any way. Mm -hmm. Even if they had a private detective on my tail, they would not have inferred <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. And that led also to my going to Maimonides and having a dream laboratory to explore it. So I had a, a, a career in parapsychology. And so I was curious about this and the only place I could go to to find out how can, how can this occur? You know, it's, it's not within the ordinary uh, paradigms of science that because uh, not uh, picking up something telepathically at the time that it happens is impossible in, 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 in within the scientific parameter because nothing, no, no signal can go from one place to another faster than light. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if something's going on immediately, you, that's called non-locality. You can't, you can't determine the local factors responsible for transferring a signal from one place to another. Mm -hmm. So dreams are non-local, and dreams will pick up, <coughs> even precognitively, because time and space are not relevant to dreaming. They're only metaphors in dreaming. We don't go by time, space, and causality in our dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, so occasionally we'll, we'll pick up something happening across space, telepathy or of course time precognitively. Mm -hmm. So there are four dimensions that can get into dream work. Can you say anything about um, like when you have a dream and you, you like you dream you're crying and then you actually wake up crying or you dream that you're laughing and you actually wake up you were laughing? Yes, oh absolutely, sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, dreams release, release. Uh, emotional energy, and, and if you wake up in the middle of a dream where, uh, you know, you may find yourself laughing or weeping, or moving, and not fighting. Mm. Walking. Mm. Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking, yeah, anything things can happen. Uh, is there a barrier that's... Is there what? If, does, is that a sign that there's some kind of barrier that's broken down there for you, that you, you've well, crossed into another? Well, no, it's just a sign that I guess the, the, the affective imagery, the emotion, emotional energy there uh, uh, brings you to a waking state so quickly that you're still in both states at the same time, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Can you say, what do you think? A lot of times in dream work, we'll get into word play or word analysis. Oh yes, absolutely. And I'm wondering what the significance of that is. I, the only example I can think of right now is a dream I had where there were a bunch of nuts, and then people started talking about my nutty relationships. It's like a pun or something like that. Well, and that we do a lot of that. And I'm wondering yeah, yeah, what's the significance? Right. Why would those things no be significant? No question about it. No question about it. Why would those things be significant? Right. Right. I had a woman in my group who, was, who had the multiple sclerosis in the early stages. And then it was beginning to impair her walking. She came in with a dream of, of Michael Caine, Mike Caine. And a woman who, who discovered that her <laughs> husband was having an affair that she didn't know about, dreamt of Connecticut. He was disconnected from me. <laughs> so, you, so you have all kinds of wonderful play. We are all creative geniuses asleep. We don't, 
Mm. You know, we grow up unaware of this creative impulse that functions 24 hours a day. The only people who are creative are, are people who, who make beautiful pictures. That's creativity. But, but we are intrinsically creative. You can't be a human being and you're creative until the day you die, because you keep dreaming, whether you want to or not. I mean, that brings up another thing, which is when I'm recording my dreams, sometimes, the, because I'm more visual, sometimes when I'm recording them, I feel like my words aren't really doing them justice, mm -hmm. and that I'm changing the meaning of the dreams by what I'm writing. No yeah, question about absolutely. Yeah. Before I call that secondary elaboration, because, you know, if, if you go to a, a, a museum, mm -hmm. and you get a gut feeling of and seeing a painting, mm. and you go outside and try to tell your friend about, what, about it, mm. you're doing it in words, you're doing it in a different medium, completely different medium. Because waking consciousness is, is effective because we're able to see the world uh, through language, through the discreteness of objects around us, through separation, and so on. There's no such thing as separation in a dream. A dream flows, a dream uh, is fluid. A, a dream is um, ha has no business with uh, time, space, and causality and logic. It has its own logic, an emotional logic. Each scene is emotionally connected, not logically connected, but emotionally connected to the next scene, and so on. It's interesting because of the, when you say time, space, and causality, is when I wake up from a dream, it, it is simultaneous. And yet, when I start to write it down, I realize I have to put it in sequence to understand right. it. Exactly. And so exactly. It's like taking a circle and making it into right. a line. Right. You know? <laughs> and it's, I know I people come in and say, I had a short dream. But when you put it into words, oh. <laughs> it takes a <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, it might seem like a second, and then the next thing you know, you've got going through all this paper. And that's interesting. Can I just ask you again for clarification? Like you said, you can have spiritual, transcendent, or cosmic. Uh, uh, dreams or how, well, so I mean, let's suppose someone has a dream of, of like radiant light surrounding them or something like that. How does, is that what you're referring to? And, and if it is, how does that differ, let's say, from from a spiritual archetype? That you spoke about? Well, archetype, you know, is a term for more than, more than, that, Jung had a term for that, big dream. Big dream? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a term for that. Mm -hmm. And what he meant is you, you're in a dream that is ineffable. ineffable. And there's nothing, you can't do anything with it. You can just enjoy it. You can't, there's nothing else you can do with it. It's a gift. That's all. <laughs> it's interesting when you talk about Jung because you, you give me a different understanding of it in that it, it's still always based in personal experience. Yes. And that's, I appreciate that. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> A lot of time, um, dreams is um, kind of so fast. Like I dream the minute that I start to doze off, and but it's interesting when I woke up. I there are certain images or certain part that remains in me, you know. But most of the time, it's always part of something more complicated and longer. And yeah. how should we? Um, <laughs> What should we focus on? Well, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to recapture because a dream is fundamentally a creature of the night. Mm -hmm. And we're the accidental beneficiaries of it if we get it and are able to work with it. <coughs> and sometimes we have the feeling that we had a long dream and can only recognize a fragment. And um, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it except to wake up as slowly and as gradually as you can, to try to not be too ambitious about getting it all back, but grab back anything you can get, a feeling, tone, a color, an image, and if you can bring that back, you can maybe bring back some more. Uh, but if you wake up at an alarm clock, it's going to knock it out of your head very quickly. Uh, but the only real way to do it, you want me to show you the real way? Uh, find the nearest sleep laboratory, go in, have them put electrodes on your head, and measure the electroencephalographic recording and eye movements, and have them wake you up 
at the end of every REM period because you'll be, you'll be spending, if you're sleeping eight hours, you'll be spending two hours dreaming and you'll have all the dreams you want. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we get to tell, I suppose we just tell our partners to wake us up. <laughs> yeah, if they stay up all night, they, <laughs> and, 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 and look at you through a red light or something, they'll pick up your eye movement, and when it's, 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 the, the uh, incident is over, they'll wake you up, and you yeah, yeah, yeah. People remember their dream when they're woken up that, immediately, mm -hmm. not afterward. That's interesting. Do, do you have anything to say about lucid dreaming? No. <laughs> I mean, not, no, seriously. It, it, it's an in-between stage. It's, it's a little of both. And it's uh, been pursued in research and it was interesting and so on, but I haven't gotten involved in it. And I, I just, I'm satisfied with the real thing. <laughs> I don't like it when the ego gets involved. <laughs> So the lucid dream is when you realize that you are dreaming yes. and you want to, I, that that I wanted to ask you something right. a minute. And you want to just, you can control. You can control it sometimes, that's a real lucid But this dream. is not a real dream. Well, it's called a lucid dream because it's, you're controlling it and yet you're working with the spontaneous imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just, both. And since we're kind of going off into this other direction, I mean, what about hallucinations and things like this? When you see things, but they're not, um, I mean when you're awake? When you're awake, is that, connect, is that connected to the ego also in that way? Well, I guess everything's connected to it, but... Yeah, uh, I mean, you could... Uh, you mean you actually see something clearly? Uh-huh, okay, yeah. Can you give me an example of what you mean? Uh, <laughs> um, oh. For instance, you're, ta you're talking to someone and you flash and you're thinking of something else at the same time. And it transforms the situation where you kind of are someplace else. Where well, you're someplace else, but do you actually see something external to you? That's yeah. what an hallucination is. You're seeing something external to you that doesn't exist out there. Right, yeah. Is that what you see? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm thinking you're not describing it that way. No, I, I guess I'm thinking of things like shadows or branches that start to seem like something else to... Projections. Like projections, projections. I guess. Yeah, you're, you're projecting, or your imagination is active and you're projecting it and it seems to fit into aspects of the outside world in some way and so on. I'm not sure I would call it a clear hallucination. Mm. And it's different than, a, I guess it's different than a dream yeah. because you're still awake. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that part of us is active all the time. Right. Awake, it's like a Greek chorus, you know? If, if we, <laughs> if we um, uh, deviate from our own humanity in a situation because of the context of the situation, there's a Greek chorus that says, I'm going to bring this to your attention when you go to sleep tonight. <laughs> this is your fate to, to, to own up to it. When we deviate from our humanity, that the dreaming comes to try to correct it, or at least make us aware. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it, 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 it's there to keep us honest because you know uh, it, it's the gap between expediency and fitting into a culture, oh. and and the cost in our own humanity. That is the you know the stuff that feeds the dream. Hmm. So, what about in cultures where dreaming is encouraged and uh, the like? Those are the those are the cultures that that use dreams to deepen the bonding that occurs in that culture, and we've lost that knack. You see, primitive cultures never lost a knack of dream sharing and using dreams constructively. As the, because dreams, by healing the individual, heals everybody who's involved. Mm -hmm. We don't live our life in a closet. It, it's a healing mechanism for culture as well as for the individual. And once we got into the industrial revolution and, you know, uh, let people uh, bypass their own dream life because they had no no relevance to profit, 
by technology, we were lost. We're still lost with the kind of culture. Uh, and uh, it, isn't, uh, it isn't that our dreams will, uh, dream work will save the world, but if we engage in dream work, you'll realize the world needs saving. Mm -hmm. Do you find, like in groups that you've had for long periods of time where you've been together for a mm -hmm. while, can you say anything about what yeah. happens there? Well, well, okay. You can use in a dream group, you get to know people and their emotional mood at the end. And you can use anything that came up in the dream work, in the dream group, that was known to everybody in your projections. So you can use that to an advantage in the game, as long as everybody knows it. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh. Sounds like when, the, when you see a theme maybe come up over and over when one dreamer's kind of dreams, even though they're different dreams, they seem to have certain things Thieves. that they have. Yeah. Repetitive yeah. dreams, but they're always a little, <coughs> little different. different. There's slight difference, sure. And, and if you're lucky enough to have a repetitive dream and have an opportunity to deal with it and clarify it, it goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, so what you're saying is that because we heard this dream today, if next week I have a dream about a fish, it could be relevant. Right. To, or well, if, 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 whatever, if you came in with another dream about a fish, we would know what, what the fish means to, to yes. that dream. Right. Okay. My yeah. Thing, oh, yeah. You're probably trying to. Fit. I. One other thing that's provoked in my mind. If you're in a therapy group, which this is not, uh, generally people are encouraged not to form friendships or whatever among others. But what can you say anything about relationships, friendships, or intimate that might form among members of a dream group? I mean, we become, as you say, naked in the dream group, and then sometimes the clothes come back on for the rest of the time when we're relating to people in a way. And I find that disconnect a little... Well, I trusted one marriage of two people <laughs> 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 and got married. They're still married. Yes, <laughs> and have six children. <laughs> they have their own dream group. Uh, yes, you know, the, the, the rule is that, that there's a confidentiality rule that we don't talk about it outside the group. The dreamer can talk about the dream to anybody she wants to talk about it, but we don't have the privilege unless we have a permission. Um, but despite that, well, <laughs> uh, but the fact is that, that well, let me, let, me, let me describe, you know, a syndrome that I discovered. <laughs> I discovered a lot doing dream work. I mean, we, we could have a very successful session at my home. You know, and, and I have it at my home, so there are seven or eight cars in the driveway there. It's a big driveway. Uh, and then, and I have the floodlight on so people can get into the cars without bumping into each other. And uh, so I would, use, I would usually give enough time for them to, you know, get to the cars and leave, and then turn out the floodlight. And one day it, it occurred to me, it took an awful long time before and the cars were still there, and they needed the floodlight. And then I realized that, that, that they were using the time, to, that, at that time, now they could tell the dreamer what the dreamer really meant. <laughs> <laughs> See, everybody knows what somebody else's dream is all about. <laughs> but they don't want to break the rules. <laughs> In front of you especially. I call that the driveway syndrome. <laughs> So no, you there, discouraged there, there, And there have been many yeah. friendships that have evolved in the dream work. Fine. It's a human situation. Yeah. And the, the topic that I'm talking about is, a, is it's called dreams, healing, and communion. Because I never knew what the word communion meant. In all the years I practiced psychiatry, I never knew what the word communion meant. But I do know what it means. I do know what the word what spirituality. Spirituality was a strange business. As a scientist, it had nothing to do with spirituality. But I do know what these words mean <coughs> to a dream work. Because well, you're generating a love relationship to each other. A supportive, helpful, non-judgmental, meaningful, interested relationship with each other. What else can you do with human beings? I mean, that's, that's, that's the formation of love and healing and brotherhood. But, uh, what about love relationships between 
between group members that don't work out, in which both members are still part of the group? Well, then you have to deal with the tension, and you have to decide, is this a tension that affects the whole group? Is it a tension that you should take up in the group, or uh, in the pro group process, or should you deal with the two people alone? I once had a situation arrive where there was a tension between two of the people there, and I decided to deal with it with it too, and what I found out was that they were uneasy because both were working with the same analyst, mm -hmm. and they were uncomfortable about it. So, so you do have, you know, tensions can arise in a group, you just have to recognize them and make a decision as to how to handle it. Sometimes I will stop the process and try to handle it, and sometimes I will do it privately. Do you, do you feel that, um, that all the characters in the dream are parts of the dreamer? I feel whatever the dreamer feels about them is true. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would call this the ideal dream. In every room. It was a dream. It was a dream. Hold it, hold it. We don't want to get out of here without doing any more damage. Thank you, too. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks for your videoing.